Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen McBride. I'm the Director of Services at AWARE, uh, as you'll see from the, uh, the title on the uh, screen there. And I'm delighted uh, to be joined today for our uh, webinar, our July, our monthly webinar series on perinatal mental health by Dr. Gillian Doyle, a Senior Clinical Psychologist in Perinatal Mental Health at the Rotunda National Maternity Hospital. And I invite Gillian to introduce herself in, in a minute. Uh, um, I'll just give a, a little brief moment for people to, um, to log on to the webinar and to get settled. So uh, I'll, I'll leave a little bit of time and space for that now. Okay, so um, as, as I said at, at the introduction, I'm delighted to, to welcome Dr. Gillian Doyle along for, for this webinar, our monthly webinar series uh, that we offer uh, at AWARE. And our purpose at AWARE, as you'll see on the slide there in front of you, is to provide support, education and information to people who experience depression, uh, bipolar disorder and other mood related conditions. And we do so through a suite of support services, education and wellbeing programs and with a wide repository and detailed information on our website pertaining to depression and, and bipolar disorder. So I'd encourage you to look at our website aware.ie at your convenience to get further information about what we offer. Uh, as I said, uh, this webinar is titled Perinatal Mental Health. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Dr. Gillian Doyle to introduce herself, and then we can get on with it with the conversation together with, about all things perinatal mental health. It's lovely to meet you, uh, Gillian, and I'm looking forward to our conversation this afternoon. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Stephen has said, I'm uh, Gillian Doyle. I'm a clinical psychologist and I work in the Rotunda Hospital. I work on the specialist perinatal mental health team. Um, so we see uh, women who are booked with in the Rotunda Hospital with all different sorts of mental health difficulties. And we see women from pregnancy right through to one year uh, postnatally um, and we offer group interventions and individual interventions and various different types of support. Um, and just to say the perinatal mental health teams are fairly new teams in this country. Um, there have been different professionals working in perinatal mental health for a long number of years, um, but having a full team is fairly new, uh, but there are uh, fully stocked teams in some of the bigger hospitals across the country. And then in smaller units, there are um, mental health midwives working um, to look after the mental health needs of people presenting during pregnancy and beyond. Great, that's very, very interesting, Gillian. But what's your sense of uh, the idea of, of that renewed energy or new teams or that focus being placed on uh, perinatal mental health? Because it, it, it seems to me to make great sense. And what do you see as the impact of that being uh, for uh, for families, but in the main for, for expectant uh, mothers. Well, you know, I think it makes uh, a huge amount of sense to start um, providing mental health services to uh, the population at the beginning of life. So if we think about um, holding the mother in mind, we're also holding uh, the baby in mind and hopefully setting both mom and baby up um, for, you know, good mental health, good mental health experience and good experiences with mental health services throughout the lifespan. Um, I think it's a really important step um, to look after women during their pregnancy. Um, you know, I'll talk about pregnancy being a very kind of turbulent time in life, becoming um, a parent for the first time is um, a huge challenge um, and it comes uh, with great joy but also great fear um, and that's before we kind of add mental health into the mix at all I think it's kind of a universally challenging experience um, so it's so important that people have a support team at their back during that time um, and that they feel like they can get off on on a good footing um, you know in this country we don't have a mother and baby unit and I think that's something that the mental health professionals are really pushing for so that we can cater to the needs of people um, 
who are experiencing really difficult mental health challenges. So hopefully that's kind of the next step for us. But this is a really, really good and important first step. Great. It's great to hear, you know, and it's, 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 it's I, I wholeheartedly agree with, you, you know, the provision of support and, um, you know, those interventions, you know, and supporting people's mental health, you know, at, at the earliest onset of life, you know, uh, as you say, the perinatal stage. And just to confirm that, you know, for our audience, you know, the perinatal stage that that goes right back from a, a pre-pregnancy almost, as it were, all the way up to one year post delivery of of of, uh, of your baby of, of a mother's baby yeah i suppose it goes from the time of conception um to uh when baby is a year um now obviously mental health comes into decisions to become pregnant um into thinking about that maybe for some people because of their um situation they will decide not to have a baby or to have a baby and um, for some people their journey to pregnancy can be a really difficult one and so um, that might have an impact on their mood or their well-being so of course for some people mental health comes into pregnancy before mm. conception mm. even um, and, and is a very important part of that journey. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, Gillian. And in relation to Guan, would you, would you like to speak a little bit more about what you're seeing going on? And uh, we'll, we'll see how that develops into the conversation together or some of your, your, your observations and the work that you're doing in, in, in the Rotunda uh, as part yeah. of that team. Yeah, well, I suppose what I was thinking I would talk a little bit about, or I thought it might be helpful for people to think about, um, were some of the, I suppose, psychological factors that need to be negotiated during the perinatal period um, and how they can impact on a person's sense of self and on their sense of becoming a parent, whether that's a mom or a dad. Um, and I suppose my hope would be that by kind of highlighting these different factors, people can be mindful of them um, and reflect on where they're at if, um, if someone is kind of pregnant or has just become a parent or um, is about to become a parent or is thinking about conceiving. Um, because in some ways, if we can think of psychological factors as, as tasks, then it's something to work towards and it's something that a person can think about. Um, and I suppose in my work, that's oftentimes what I'm facilitating. I'm facilitating a person to understand themselves, um, understand their past, understand their present, understand their wishes for the future. Um, mm. And then to think through what might be holding them back, what are their strengths and how can we build on one to support the other? Um, and and that's, that's really my role, whether it be done in a group or in an individual setting. Um, mm. But um, I, I actually, there's, there's a quote I really like, and I, I thought I might share it at the start. Um, it's from yes. Osho, who some people will have heard of. He was a, a guru um, back, I think, in the, the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, and it was a supervisor of mine that, that shared this with me a long time ago, actually. Um, Very good. Yeah, before I worked in perinatal mental health, um, but, but the quote is that the moment a child is born, the mother is also born. She never existed before. The woman existed, but the mother never. A mother is something absolutely new. Um, mm. And I love that quote because I just think it's so hopeful. Um, mm. It can really help us think about um, how to move towards becoming a mom and also... Mm help think through this idea that we don't need to come into it fully formed um, yes you know no matter how much exposure you've had to children throughout your life having a child of your own is something totally new um, yes yes indeed and the experience of, of of pregnancy you know can be very different different uh depending even on a second or third pregnancy but also for uh, a first time expectant mother you know that's uh, and perhaps it's not their first time being pregnant uh, unfortunately and we're talking then in the area of loss and uh, miscarriage 
And yet also the idea, I suppose, Gillian, then that pregnancy is a fraught uh, journey and developmental, isn't it? Because there's a growing being in your in your womb, in your uterus. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think to add to that, you know, we often think of the journey of adolescence as being very turbulent. And we often talk about the hormonal adolescent because there's so much going on in the body. But we don't actually think about that so much for pregnancy. But there is so much going on in the body. As you say, Stephen, there's actually a new being growing inside of your body and how that feels to you. Um, and then there's all of this kind of psychological turbulence of letting go of the old you or letting go of some parts of that old part of you and then moving through that through like this stage of flux and who am I going to be and what do I want to be and, and what is this going to be like and then coming out the other end um, yes as yeah. with this new oh. element of your identity um, which is you know the identity of parent whether that is um mother or father or actually you know other other support people as well like there might be people um watching this webinar who are going to become grandparents um and that's a whole new part of of their identity as well um mm -hmm. the, that identity and, and how that's different from being a parent to being a, a grandparent Mm, indeed, indeed. I, I really uh, resonating and connecting in with your words, Gillian, of letting go of something as you take up a new position or taking on something new, which is becoming a parent, as you say, whether it's a mother and a father. And for for uh, expectant fathers out there, I, 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 I'm conscious of that, too, you know, that it's not just about the perinatal mental health aspect of it, it, it pertains to all uh, types of relationships, inclusive of uh, fatherhood and motherhood. Uh, and, and yet, am I right in saying, Gillian, that the main focus would be relating to uh, expectant mothers uh, yeah. in, in that? Yes, C certainly in, uh, in the perinatal mental health services here in Ireland, um, we do mainly cater to um, mothers at the moment. Um, and I think that's a resources issue. You know, I think if we had all of the resources in the world, we would love to cater um, to partners as well. Um, because, you know, obviously they're going through their own journey. Um, mm -hmm. We know that up to like 10% of um, partners will experience some sort of mental health difficulty as well. Um, and, you know, there's seismic changes that happen in a relationship um, when, when, you know, whether it's a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth person is added into the mix, um, just the dynamics of the relationship will, you know, obviously and understandably change. And then when, when that, is, that person is a baby, there are just huge changes. Um, sure, sure, indeed. And, and, I, and I dare say, Gillian, trying to think about it, that it's so important around the social support that uh, a, a person journeying into parenthood has around them, you know, at a familial level or at a relationship level, but also more widely, you know, within as a societal perspective. And again, that's back to the, so both and, you know, the idea at a, at a kind of personal level, but also from the work that you're doing and your team and the development of knowledge and awareness around perinatal mental health for uh, for uh, parents, soon to be parents, who maybe have a, a diagnosis of depression or bipolar disorder or another uh, mood related condition. Yeah, like so I think social support is one of the most important interventions um, that we can, um, I suppose, provide someone with or signpost them to. Um, and it's really, I think, important to start thinking about social support during pregnancy. You know, I feel oftentimes people are so tired during pregnancy and there's so much going on that it can be hard to think beyond the birth but if you've any kind of reserves of energy during pregnancy that is the time to sit down and put in supports for post pregnancy um, mm. because mm. the tiredness won't stop 
um, for a while at least, um, unless you're one of these kind of unicorn babies uh, who sleeps. Um, but generally for most people, in the postpartum period, there is sleep deprivation. And we all know that it's much harder to function when you have sleep, when you're sleep deprived. And so whatever supports you can put in, linking in with different things, even just researching so you know what supports are available to you. If you can do that during pregnancy, then it's just going to be that bit easier to access them in the postpartum period. Mm. Um, and I think when we can think about supports, we think about them in different ways. So you can think about your, your primary support yes. person, whether that is a partner or it might not be a partner. A lot of people yes. now are, are going through pregnancy by themselves, but hopefully yes. people will be linked in with someone who's going to be, you know, your person, your primary person. Um, and just to think through what's their role going to be in the early days or weeks um, after baby comes. So, you know, if if mom is taking on, you know, the primary kind of caregiver role, which often happens, um, particularly if mom is breastfeeding, um, mm. then what is the other person going to do and, and what are the roles that they can take on? How do they support mom in her role? Um, and, you know, luckily enough, I think we now have... Um, a number of weeks parents leave in, in this country, um, up to seven weeks um, that can be taken. So oftentimes there will be someone around for the first few weeks of baby's life. Um, yes. ho hopefully to take up a lot of the slack if there's other children in the house or if there's meals to be cooked or um, housework to be done um, so that that mum can rest. And, and oftentimes mm. we're talking about women who've been through, you know, um, a, like a very uh, big life event that is birth. So you might, the woman herself might be very sore. She might have had yes. um, a C-section, which is a surgery. So she's may not be as mobile um, as she would like to be or you know if she's had a vaginal birth she may just be kind of sore or you know feeling mm. very de depleted in energy um, and so she'll need a lot of support um, from the partner and then you've got the kind of wider circle so who are the others uh -huh. you know, in the family or good friends who can um, come over and help out and in what way can they do that? Um, I know um, for me, when I had my own children, there was a rule that you couldn't come to my house unless you brought a meal. Um, and, good. you know, I think things like that, just putting in place those kind of simple things um, meant that we were well fed, but also people didn't come with an expectation that they were going to be looked after. And I think in Ireland, culturally, we have this idea of looking after our guests and, you know, yes. making them tea and coffee and offering biscuits. And that's so wonderful. Um, but at the same time, maybe mm. that's not the time, you know, the early mm. kind of few weeks after a baby yeah. is born where you mm. should be asked to do that. Yeah, um, I, I really like tuning into it, listening to you, Gillian, talking about, you know, it's, it's very practical, but it makes really sound sense for you know as you as you link the psychological factors to tasks and that is a task kind of to articulate your need isn't it or to yeah. for a person to articulate their need in this instance as you say very practically that uh yeah i, I welcome a, a visit and and yet the provision of uh, uh nourishment as it were you know uh food will be you know can you bring something along with you you know and i know it sounds very practical but it's very uh, hopeful too and it's a very solid message that uh, a new parent uh, a, a mother a, and or a, the, the father you know have other needs to uh, I suppose psychologically nourish their own infant who may be the first second third fourth or more uh, ch uh, child that they have with it within that family unit whatever makeup of the family unit it is. Yeah, and I suppose I'm I'm very cognizant also, Stephen, that there's a lot of people who may not have kind of family or close friends yes. around them. Um, and I'm also thinking, as I say that, about COVID and people who've given birth during COVID and how mm. unsupported they felt um, yes. when they weren't able to have people 
um, to their home to visit them. And it's such a huge loss. Um, and even people who've had one baby during maybe COVID and lockdown, and now we're having their second baby, you might see huge differences in terms of the support they can access. Yeah, which which maybe actually will be able to be worked through more it, 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 helpfully in a sense that uh, support is available because the uh, inability to access support because of the restrictions, the public health restrictions led to the kind of a development of, of mental health uh, difficulties or, you know, um, a person maybe found themselves experiencing um, low mood uh, on account of feeling alone or being alone, very much yeah. being alone. Yeah. And, you know, I think just to kind of highlight the professional organisations that that are, that are there, you know, again, if we think of our support, we've got our primary person and we've got yes. family and close friends. And then hopefully outside that, we've got our support services like our, um, you know, primary care services, the GPs, the public health nurses who can be so important in the early days of baby's life, um, and then services like ourselves um, in the perinatal mental health service, where if mm. someone is experiencing a mental health difficulty, they can come and meet with someone and work out a plan, whether that plan is individual treatment, group treatment or medication um, mm. or services like yourselves um, mm. who, you know, are open to everyone and, and people can access mm. um, your services too um, for much mm. needed support as well. Um, mm. So I think it's very important to think about, well, who are the um, professional services that I might need to have? Yes. You know, linked in with and, and oftentimes women will link in with our service during pregnancy and they'll say look I'm grand I just want to know you're here and I want you to know Very I'm good. here and if I need you when the time comes I just want mm. to know I've reached out and that's brilliant because we know then that that woman has started to think through what her needs will be mm. um, yeah great it's so protective um, yeah and then I think also beyond that, there's so many um, different, you know, groups where new parents can meet each other. And oftentimes that's the most important form of support because you feel that you're not alone and you can check in with people, see whether someone else is experiencing something similar to yourself. Um, and that can be such an important way to you know, work through different kind of normal difficulties of becoming a new parent. But those are the difficulties that mm. if, if we don't have support around them can end up tripping us up or can end up leading to self-criticism, <coughs> excuse me, or feeling not good enough. Um, yes. And, and I wanted to tune into that. And I'm glad, you know, I was thinking a little bit about that, the idea. And I was wondering about both at a, perhaps an individual level and a societal level, you know, self-criticism and some aspect of, of pressure, you know, uh, that uh, can be vested upon or, or that uh, a, 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 an expectant parent uh, experiences on that journey to becoming a parent, you know. And, and I suppose I'm, I'm being uh, broad-based in that, Gillian, you know, whether it's a, a first child that they're expecting or a second or third, you know, yeah. I suppose mental health is uh, is very uh, developmental and attending to it takes ongoing attention, you know, and, and practice, as it were. But this idea, coming back to it around uh, so yeah, self-criticism or and the link between that and societal pressure around parenthood uh, and, and motherhood, I suppose, too. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's interesting because when I was preparing for this talk, I was having a look at some of the myths around pregnancy and becoming a new parent. And, you know, some of the myths, and, and we all know them about pregnancy being this period of absolute joy and, yes. you know, the best time in your life and enjoy every moment. And then there's also myths about pregnancy being a period of well-being where a woman is feeling amazing um, and where um, mental health difficulties just seem to resolve themselves yes. um, or, or improve. 
And that is not the case at all. You know, um, some people might see improvements in their mental health difficulties, but that that wouldn't be the norm without some sort of intervention anyway. And yes. I think, again, some women may experience their pregnancy as, you know, a time of, of absolute bliss and joy. But for most people, pregnancy, like most life events, um, is is full of colour and grayness um, yes. and it is not black or white and so in one day you might be feeling absolutely on top of the world and you know having an absolutely miserable time at the, at the same time um, and that's a much more normal experience and you know I think it, it makes sense when we think about what's happening during pregnancy and we've already spoken a bit about it Stephen there's so much going on in the body um, that you know the woman has to negotiate so she has to negotiate changes to her body um, and that can be that can feel very pressurized you know women might be thinking I don't want my body to change too much or I want my body to change more than it has and so Sometimes there are intrusions um, from society around that. So uh -huh. pregnancy yeah. is an unusual time in that it feels like your body is not your own, both from the inside, because there's someone else growing in there, um, but mm. also from the outside, because for some reason, people feel it's OK to comment on a woman's body when she's pregnant. Mm. And so women get comments like, oh, are you expecting twins or you're massive? You must be almost due or gosh, I can't believe you're six months. You're absolutely tiny. Um, yes. And for some women, those comments won't bother them. But actually, for a lot of people, they might get stuck in their heads and they'll start thinking, well, am I eating too much? Should I be eating more? Why did that person say that? Sure. And that's yeah. understandable because our mind is busy. Our mind comments on, on things and information that other people give us. And yeah. If you're feeling anxious during pregnancy, and, and most women will have some level of anxiety because they want things to go well, those thoughts can kind of get stuck. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And I think I think the message from listening to you uh, is, is very much one of, uh, you know, validating a, a, a person's experience regarding perinatal mental health and acknowledging all that goes on at an individual a relationship and also at a societal level and trying to normalize some of the reactions they may have, which may precipitate a mental health difficulty or an experience of low mood, you know, by uh, ongoing commentary or even to extend that that they would hear, you know, around pregnancy. But yeah. also the idea that not all relationships people have are healthy or uh, positive and, and that having an impact, sure, on, on people's mental health, which we we touched on. Um, yeah, so yeah. it's very, very helpful to, to hear you say that about try, trying to uh, validate and, and normalize people's reaction to do with a growing being in, in one's body and also what that, what that means for a person psychologically and uh, yeah, societally. And, and I think also just to kind of highlight some of the other things that can happen during pregnancy so some women will experience morning sickness and other women yes. will experience morning sickness but so extreme that it impacts them all day every day during their pregnancy and that's called hyperemesis um, and for or and and then for other women they might experience kind of aches and pains during pregnancy um, for some women they will experience pain throughout their pregnancy, whether it's back pain or pain in their pelvis or swollen feet. Um, but you can imagine like anyone who's experiencing like nausea or sickness or pain, um, you know, that makes life much more difficult. It makes it much more difficult to access the mm. things that normally give you joy, the things mm. that normally, you know, make you feel relaxed or soothed. So if you're someone who's really active, who really enjoys exercise and suddenly um, you can't walk because of pain or, you know, you're mm. vomiting all the time, that means that a huge part of your life is just suddenly 
gone um, and you're feeling miserable and then you're asking yourself well what can I do to cope now um, mm. and, and that's really a good time to ask for support whether that be from you know a medical professional and um, there are medicines you can take for um, hyperemesis or from a physiotherapist or from a mental health professional just to try and help with coping and, and engaging those social support networks yes um, so so yeah, so those are some of the kind of physical things that can happen during pregnancy that can cause a huge amount of distress. Of um, course, and the and the the fundamental link between our physical health and our mental health, and the 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 uh, knock on effect, like the symbiosis or the the link. There's just the, the core link between a person's physical health and their mental health, and vice versa. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I suppose the other piece just that jumps to mind, well, there's two pieces around that societal pressure. Um, so, so one of the things is this idea that, that um, when, when a baby is born, mum will fall in love with the baby yes. on the spot or immediately. And, you know, sometimes women refer to this kind of as the Disney moment of, you know, this sense mm. of awe and overwhelming love. Um, and that happens in some cases, but actually not in every case. So somewhere between 40 to 60 percent of people won't have that kind of moment. And, and that moment of awe or instantly falling in love, um, that's very much to do with our hormones. Um, and because just mm. after birth, um, your oxytocin is at the highest level it will ever be. Um, so you've got that rush. But if for some reason, um, that kind of hormone hormone um, isn't activated, then it's quite likely you won't have that kind of overall like that feeling. Um, and, and that's very normal. Um, and it, it doesn't mean, you know, that you won't love your baby, that you don't love your baby. Um, mm. But that can that can really kind of impact yeah. on, on a sure. woman. Sure, that's a, such a supportive message, Gillian. It's it's great to hear that you know around being so supportive of uh, a, a new mother, you know, yeah. uh, and the and the connection that they feel, you know, it, it isn't the ultimate, you know. It's very helpful to hear, you know, you, that this Disney moment is a little bit fantastical. I think absolutely, and you know, I think. And it's not to say like fantasy is so important during pregnancy and particularly in the latter stages of pregnancy, it's brilliant to fantasize. So to think about your baby, think what they look like. Oh, will they be like this person or that person? And that's how we develop this being in our mind and a mm. lot of women will find themselves having dreams about the baby or yes. you know going shopping for little outfits for baby and those are really really important steps in bonding um having conversations with your partner about things you're going to do or um yeah so all of those really important things you can do touching your bump singing to baby um, I, I know a number of years ago they used to talk about playing classical music to baby so that baby yeah. would come out as the next Mozart. Um, <laughs> but even fantasizing of your baby as the next Mozart is so important, you know, if that's, yeah. if that's what does it for you. Um, yes. And, and for some people, that fantasizing can be really difficult if you've had an experience of loss, if you've had a difficult journey towards pregnancy. Um, yes. Because there might be a fear there. What if I love this baby and, and then, you know, I lose it. And again, yes, that's so understandable. Um, and that might be something that you might link in with a service about that you might access support around. Um, or for some people, what starts happening is that as the pregnancy progresses and gets past certain milestones, they then allow themselves to dream and to fantasize. And that can be so protective. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, indeed, indeed. That I'm not going to allow myself to get excited or to enjoy this because I've experienced X, Y, or Z or experienced such loss and such emotional pain yeah. through loss previously, of course. It's yes. such a complicated time and an anxious time for all parties concerned. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and it's trying to, and I, I really gone back to the 
sense I'm getting from you, Gillian, and you and the work that you're doing with your colleagues in the Rotunda, it's trying to uh, provide as much wraparound support to, uh, uh, to mothers, to expectant mothers, their partners, loved ones, as uh, this journey unfolds, you know, yeah. and protecting their mental health and being as supportive as possible through validation, really, isn't it? And yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, to, to try and, and make sure that women feel held as they're doing the work that needs to be done um, at this really important time. Um, and, and I think, you know, the other thing, just thinking through birth and expectations, oftentimes women will have expectations of their of their labor and the birth itself. Um, mm -hmm it's a really good thing to become informed about. Um, I would always encourage women to uh, learn about birth, learn about the different types of birth, learn about what can go wrong, what can go right. Um, there's lots of hypnobirthing courses on offer, um, both in the hospitals and outside yes. of the hospitals or birth preparation courses. And these are so helpful to just educate both the pregnant person, but also their partner and, and give the partner a role because the partner, of course, can learn really helpful techniques to support a woman during labor. Um, so as much as you can to inform yourself um, and to feel right, I have an idea about how I'd like this to go. And, and then if you can, on the day when things start to happen, um, and this is such a hard thing to, to say or to ask of people, but to loosen the grip of the expectations um, because you are stepping into the unknown. It's like um, Indiana Jones um, when he steps off that bridge. I think it's in, in uh, Indiana Jones and the yes. Last Crusade. Um, and, and he just is stepping into the unknown and, and hopefully will, well, will be caught. Um, yeah. But, but, it, but birth is unpredictable, I think, is what unpredictable. it's Unpredictable. And it's kind of a, a letting go of control because you have a lot of control in relation to following, you know, not eating X, Y and Z or uh, not take, taking alcohol, whatever it is, you know, around the medical and psychological advice around pregnancy, you know, uh, and, and doing the best thing by yourself and by baby. And yet when it comes to the birthing, uh, the, 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 the baby's in, in control. Is that right as such you know or well, not in control I, but go on say I, a bit about I, that i think the baby is coming yeah um, so so are, is it, I, I i always like to talk to women about this being a journey that yes they are going on with babies so they are going through this on the outside but there is a member of their team going through this on, on the inside um and i think that's a really nice way to think about it um and you know i think there's also other members of your team, uh, who are your um, your midwife or your obstetrician, um, your mental health team, if, if we're involved, obviously we, we are not there on the day. Um, but all of these people who are there to try and back you up. Um, now, having said that, it's so important that you have trust in your team um, because, you know, if you're going into a situation and feeling, I don't trust, then it's much more difficult. It's much more anxiety provoking. So there is this kind of balance of letting go of control a bit, um, but also being your own advocate. And if something doesn't feel right, just saying, whoa, hold on a second. Can you just explain that to me in a different way? Because I don't understand what's happening. Um, because, because sometimes the people on your team, they're doing this every day. And so- yes their language, um, you know, that they're maybe talking very fast or explaining something that makes perfect sense to them. Um, but it would be like someone trying to explain anything in IT to me. It just sounds totally foreign. I have no clue what's going on. And I just would need to pause someone and say, sorry, can you, can you use English there or just slow it down a bit? Um, and the other, the other thing that happens, you know, as I said, birth, it's unknown, it's anxiety provoking. And what we know about the brain in those kind of situations is that um, the thinking part of the brain tends to shut down a bit as our emotional brain takes over. So yes. 
it's much harder to hear and process that kind of information. Um, and, and so it's important that, that people, um, I suppose, come to your pace rather than you needing to, to get to their pace. Um, because yes. really the understanding needs to be, you know, at, at your level, whatever your level is in that moment. Yes. Um, and, and the other thing we know is that for birth to progress optimally, um, a woman needs to feel safe. And, and that is so important. So however mm. you find safety during birth, if you can get to that, mm. um, then that's going to really, really help. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. I suppose we've, in our conversation this afternoon, Gillian, we've touched on, you know, the experience perhaps of uh, planning to conceive, you know, uh, people trying to conceive, inclusive of all aspects of, of relationship types and, and not a, 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 a person by themselves uh, conceiving a baby um, through assisted reproduction, all, all uh, shapes and, and stripes of, of pregnancy and then into the birthing. And I suppose to move it on a little bit in relation to that and perhaps well, the most well-known aspect of the perinatal mental health stage is around postnatal depression. And I suppose that I was linking that from listening to you to some of it perhaps being to do, obviously, people who have experienced depression that might link to that or lead to that, but actually the idea that not feeling as though you have that attachment or, uh, you know, a bond is often more uh, used word, but, you know, not having that experience of complete love and joy. And I really liked listening to you kind of debunking some of that or trying to normalize some of that. But, you know, in a, in a, in a way... What's your sense, I suppose, of postnatal depression and uh, it's, it's how, how it plays out or, or, or emerges? And I suppose there's a, a wide or a broad answer to that, maybe. But just your, yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I suppose postnatal depression is um, a very common mental illness um, mm. during the perinatal period. Um, as, as around one in eight to one in 10 women may have an experience of postnatal depression. And just to kind of differentiate it from the baby blues, the baby blues yes. is an experience of kind of low mood or fluctuating mood that about 80% of women have in the first two weeks after birth as your hormones settle. So generally, postnatal depression um, will hang around for a lot longer. For mm. a lot of women, it will start during pregnancy and stay around. Um, unlike any sort of depression, you know, it's very hard to say, oh, that's why, that's why I suddenly have this experience of depression. Mm. It's oftentimes due to your own experiences, um, your own lived experience, the safety strategies that you have developed to negotiate the world in response to that. Um, it can be due, as you've said, to a previous experience um, of depression or another mental health difficulty, then you might be yes. more at risk of postnatal depression. It can be due, due to, you know, your own social circumstances. So if you're currently in difficult social circumstances, mm -hmm. it's very understandable that having a new baby is going to be that much harder of course. if you have no social support you know then you've no rest you've no break and I've mentioned already um how tiring having a baby is so um mm -hmm. and, and we all know the importance of kind of sleep and self-care and, and eating well to our mood so it's the interplay and interweave of all those different factors um and I think you know we've all already kind of touched on um you know, society and society's mm. um, expectations of mothers. Yes. Um, of, and then um, social yeah. problems going on now, perhaps around uh, that the housing situation in Ireland and what impact that has on on, uh, on parents and mothers. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think, I think we've this idea nowadays or there is this idea of having it all. Um, and, and particularly we see that on social media that, you know, everyone can do everything all the time. Um, and I think mm. it's, very, it's very hard to have it all. Again, that's one of these really black and white views. And, and for most people, the reality is some days they feel like they have it all and some days they feel like they've 
It's very Absolutely helpful. Absolutely nothing. Um, but I think, you know, there is this idea of being the perfect mother, responding perfectly to your baby. And, you know, for some people, if they haven't had an experience of, you know, optimum parenting, they might want to give their child everything they haven't had. And that's a huge pressure on yourself and can really activate the self-critic like oh you shouted there or the baby was crying for two minutes you know that's just not good enough um and i think um and we spoke about this before Stephen. um this idea of being the good enough mother is so yes. important um and it's a it's a an old kind of theory but it's an oldie and a goodie um and you know it's this idea not that it's some people take this up as settling i won't settle for being good enough that's not what this is saying what it's saying is that optimum parenting is good enough parenting yes and, and so what, what it's saying is that as best as we can we attune to and meet our babies when those needs are you know presented so when baby cries you try and figure out what's going on and you try and learn baby's cues um and then as baby gets older you know, you might be attuning to baby all the time, absolutely perfectly. And what baby is going to learn then is, is how to manage their emotions and difficult emotions, frustration, irritation, sadness. That is part of being human. It's yeah. what makes us, you know, so unique and wonderful. And yes. we're, we're teaching baby by doing that, that it's a okay to feel this. And that, you know, B, you can tolerate it and I'm going to show you how to regulate yourself. Yeah. And one of the ways we teach baby how to regulate themselves and mm -hmm. the only way we have at the beginning is how we regulate ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you make a mistake or don't get it right, First of all, you can regulate yourself and you're teaching baby how to do that. Maybe not straight away, but as they get older. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, as a child gets older, you can say, gosh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't listen to what you were saying there. Tell me about that. And mm -hmm. then you're teaching them it's, it's okay to make mistakes. You're human. I'm human. And yeah. no matter what, I love you and I'm going to be there for you. And, you know, for most of us, if we can get through life learning that, that's a, that's a pretty good internal model to have. Exactly. And a steady, steady enough path. Yeah. So it's lovely listening to you describe that, Gillian, with such uh, interest, passion and knowledge. You know, it's really you know helpful to listen to you. And I don't doubt that the participants on the, on the webinar are really attuning, to use your word, to, to your message of support and hope. And just as we move towards the latter end of the webinar, I'd like to ask uh, just to feed back a few questions to you, Gillian, uh, you know, from, from some of the audience, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a person has uh, shared that they have um, an eight month old and have suffered severe postnatal depression and is on the road helpfully towards recovery. But was wondering, are there any support uh, groups online or offline uh, around Ireland that they could access or look into? Um. So support group specific uh, to, yeah. um, uh, I suppose what I would suggest is checking in with your public health nurse. So oftentimes in certain localities, there will be, um, you know, a, a group specific to postnatal depression. Um, like I know in the Rotunda, we're linked in with both Young Valley Mun and Better Fingless, and they have different... Yes. Um, groups going on and resources i know down i'm sorry i'm very dublin centric here but i'm just talking about from my own kind of um knowledge down around the docklands there's the early learning initiative and they have lots of groups um what i would say is um if if in your locality there's something like a baby massage group that can uh -huh. be a really good group to join and oftentimes nowadays baby massage is just something we do but actually baby massage has a really really good evidence base in terms of improving bonding with baby great giving parents skills to attune to baby's needs skills you can take home 
skills you can teach to your uh -huh. partner or grandparents or whoever is in your your circle or baby circle and then it has the added be benefit of that kind of social support from other mums um, in your area um, and that can be really important so link in i would say with with the locals in in your community if there is a perinatal mental health service in your community yes. check in with them um and and then there are different kind of apps online i know someone told me there's um there's an app i think it's called peanut which is for mums now it's not a mental health app but again it, it, it's a good forum um for, you know kind of linking in that's helpful and, that's helpful indeed and, and another point has come through is um wondering about uh if you have an epidural do the drugs used affect the the birth experience, the birth experience uh, drugs used in an epidural uh, I, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure what i would say is that uh, huge numbers of people in this country have epidurals and um, have really good birth experiences so um, i don't know the research on that but i think you can um, have whatever intervention that you need and still have a really good um, birth experience and i would just encourage you ask those sort of questions of your birth provider beforehand um, but but generally I don't think um, and like if you think about a woman trying to feel as safe as possible and that is something that really helps the birth experience if an yes. epidural is part of that plan then that could be a really good intervention um, for you for someone else it might not be their intervention of choice but I think um, it's an intervention that could be really helpful for lots of women Great, right. That's great to hear, Gillian. You know, um, do you have a a, a, a final uh, message you would like to to uh, give in relation to the sphere of perinatal mental health? I could just really sense the huge empathy and uh, connection you have to the 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 topic, the sphere, but also you know in relation to uh, you know the the experience of uh, supporting people yeah. on the journey to motherhood. Um, I, I suppose there's, there's a few things. One is like. I would encourage people to have a think about your own coping skills. So just sit down, think through what soothes me, what relaxes me, what gives me joy, and um, how can I carry those things through into the postnatal period so that you still remember yourself, because it can be very easy to forget yourself within all this. Um, and, you know, mm. the, the, there is a term on this becoming a mother, it's matrescence. Um, and it's just that journey towards right. motherhood. And I think it's a lifelong journey. You know, the journey towards motherhood, it doesn't stop when baby turns one or two, because I think at every stage of development, you're met with, you know, a, a new forming person and, and so it's it's such an opportunity um to help them but it is important to to mind yourself in that um, and i think the other thing that's really important to say is, is if you have a mental health difficulty during pregnancy for some people that will cause them i suppose engaging with services will cause them a lot of distress you know what if that service criticizes me what if they think i'm not a good enough mom and that's not the case at all so our services are there as a support for people yes um and you know this isn't about you know finding you know kind of i suppose tricking people or you know um I suppose testing people to see how good a mum you are. This is about helping facilitate people get in touch with their own strengths, get the help they need. As I said, for some people that might be linking them in with the psychologist or the mental health midwife or a social worker or the psychiatrist if they need medication, um, just to help kind of set you down the right track for you. Um, and then, you know, hopefully that will be enough just linking in for a few sessions a few weeks a few months um will kind of um, help you feel really supportive and help you access your own strengths um so i really would suggest linking in early don't leave it keep yeah, early intervention yeah really yeah. really important because you know 
having a baby it's a difficult time it's also a short time and so what we don't want is for people to get maybe to the end of a six month maternity leave and say oh you know I really struggled during that and you know now I need a bit of support whereas if you had gotten support at the earlier stages then you know you could come to the end of it and say gosh it was great to get that support and then to be able to do all the fun things and have that experience of joy as well um, yeah. and, and I, I suppose maybe the last thing you know um, just to think about is um, all everything with babies is a phase and it can be helpful to to break things into blocks. I, you know, maybe the first six weeks can feel really chaotic. Baby has no routine. Sleep is all over the place. Then the next six weeks, things are maybe starting to make a little bit more sense. As you get to know this little person, they get to know you. Um, you get your first smiles, hopefully. And then three months, maybe a, a routine whatever that routine looks like for you and your baby um, starts to fall into place. So just to try and think about what are nice little milestones for you um, and to trust, right. trust yourself. Um, and um, it, when you are accessing social support, just be aware that sometimes people get really, really passionate about parenting. Um, and you don't have to take on their passions. It's really important for you to find your own way, uh, whether that's about sleep or feeding, whatever. Everyone wants to do really well by their children. And so oftentimes thinks that their way is the best, but their way might be the best for them. Exactly. Yes. The exactly. Best for you. Yeah. Um, Great. Great. Well, listen, I just want to thank you so uh, sincerely, you know, for your insights, uh, uh, knowledge and, uh, you know, passion for, for the area, you know, and, and experience that you've shared with with the participants at the, at the webinar, Gillian. It's been great to hear uh, about all, all aspects of perinatal mental health. And, and I think, um, you, you know, the expectant uh, mothers in, in your uh, area, you know, are, are, are being so well uh, thought of and, and looked after from, from what I can hear from you. So it's really lovely to, to hear that, Gillian. And, and thank you very much. And just to tune into a, a comment that was made at the, at the end, you know, in relation to that, and we always, flag and signpost people to their GPs around this webinar about, about perhaps uh, someone said that they um, vouch for their, their GP and, and practice as being such a great gateway into the, uh, the, the, the health service and the system uh, and hopefully to the perinatal mental health teams that may be and, and are required, should I say, around the country. So just to, to speak to that point too, which was, was important. And just to thank you all as an audience for your uh, participation and for your interest in, the, in this webinar on perinatal mental health and to access support from uh, social supports that you, you have uh, out there, inclusive of your GP, should you have been impacted by any of the conversation or discussion that uh, uh, ensued between um, Dr. Gillian Doyle and myself. And just to flag as well that next month, our August webinar which is going to take place at 12 midday on Wednesday, the 17th of, of August, is titled Beyond Trauma, A Space to Heal and Grow. And we'll be joined in that with uh, a researcher in the area of post-traumatic growth and also uh, a practitioner in the area of, of trauma therapy. So if you would like more further information on that, you would get it on aware.ie forward slash webinars. And you can also subscribe to our mailing list for our webinars on that uh, on, on our website. Uh, with the forward slash of webinars. I'd also invite you after this webinar for all participants that you're going to be uh, offered a link to complete a survey and it gives us great feedback in relation to how to develop uh, our webinar series. So I'd encourage all you as participants to complete that survey uh, uh, and, and take a couple of minutes to do so. And uh, again, just to uh, thank you, uh, Gillian, and to, to wish you well in the ongoing work uh, uh, that you're doing and, and for your time this afternoon and for uh, all the participants who joined as well too so on that note i'll say goodbye and have, have a lovely afternoon ahead thank you Cheerio. bye 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 bye, -bye.